The Spin-Off Podcast Network. Skinny are helping you show how smart you are with the 1Q Quiz, an all-new, super-challenging and super-quick daily quiz built by The Spin-Off. Every Monday, Skinny are giving you the chance to prove you're smart with the Skinny Extra Credit question. Get it right, and you'll get the chance to score yourself some Skinny Extra mobile credit so you can text, call, or even video call your group chat and gloat about how big your brain is. T's and C's apply. The Fold is brought to you by O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. No mai hoki mai ki other fold e mihi nei ko Duncan Grieve talking wa. Uh, this episode is uh, brought to you by our partners, by the the folds, um, very generous sponsors at O Media, uh, who are putting together a package of, of uh, an event based around sustainability, which honestly is very. Uh, you know, I think to a lot of people, and, and this is part of the challenge, right, is that it can seem quite yawn-inducing or scary or like, like you name it, especially during, and we really get into this, like a, a time when, you know, the cost of living crisis can feel such a more immediate challenge than, than all of the bundle of issues that, that sit under um, sustainability. So what I've tried to do with this, we've got two exceptional guests, Nikki Wright, who who founded Wright Communications to address exactly these topics, but did it in 2006, which I think, you know, you know how bone deep someone's kind of passion and commitment is when they're, they've been in that space and they founded it bef- way before the sort of the, 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 the societal impetus came around to the extent it is now. Uh, and also joined by by David Robertson from Hubwide, which really really interesting business that works with other organisations to use behavioural psychology, neuroscience uh, to basically kind of help them create a more of an emotional connection uh, that that will kind of push through some of these quite knotty and complex topics. Um, so they're they're two real experts in this space and they're also just you know that this is not a passing fad to them this is not something they picked up in the last couple of years this is this runs pretty deep and and i think over the the past year and nikki makes reference to the, the surveys which, which sort of bear this out there there's this sense that um maybe we got in our, over our skis on sustainability the emphasis got too much this is both at a sort of political and and a kind of a business level and I think what both of them do, and this is why I've actually been wanting to have people from the kind of communications field on this podcast for a while, is like, how do you cut through that? Because that, that matters to journalists. Like the, the incentives around publishing climate change journalism, if people don't read it, become pretty low. Uh, you know, that, that matters to people working in columns within organizations, whether they're facing inwards or outwards. There's, there's not many parts of the broad media infrastructure that that um, don't have to to sort of pay attention to this, particularly as the sort of legal framework that governs and starts to try and point us towards a lower emissions future that is kind of less destructive to the planet we're um, standing on really kicks into gear. So that's basically the fundamental nature of this conversation. Uh, it's with two really, really strong practitioners in the area. Uh, Nikki Wright from Wright Communications and David Robertson from Hardwired uh, on the fold. Uh, Nikki, David, tēnā korua and uh, welcome to the fold. Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you, yeah. Um, Nikki, I wonder if you could start by telling me about the, the founding impetus for Wright Communications. Yeah, there were there were two major things really. Uh, May two thousand and six, I'd watched Al Gore's An Inconvenient Truth, and I have to say that really it lit a fire inside me. It was so confronting. At the time, I was working in corporate communications and really in highly regulated industries, oil, pharmaceuticals. These companies have amazing management systems, um, and I was focusing on corporate social responsibility for them. So I was doing the CSR, but I was thinking it would be amazing to do the same kind of work, but for companies that were more inclined to be doing the right thing in general. So for me, it was about 
you know, December that year, I had basically decided I'm going to set up my own agency and I sold my VW Golf that I had been working really hard to pay for. Um, I bought four computers and a Cisco phone system and upschooled myself on FSC certification and got uh, some business cards printed with Veggie Inks and rented some space at Surf Corp on level 27 of the, the PwC tower in downtown Auckland. And Right Communications was born. And we, we set up to serve uh, companies that were really engaged in sustainability and needing help communicating that mission. It's so interesting, right, because, you know, this is feels still like a, a, a pregnant, evolving kind of conversation, but also what you're describing is, you know, happened almost 20 years ago now. How, what was the, the general market reaction to it? Were, were you the sort of first or among the first in this space? And, and yeah, how did the, the sort of, the, when, when you took the proposition to people, what was the reaction? Well, there was a growing membership of organisations joining Sustainable Business Network and what was then the New Zealand Business Council for Sustainable Development, which is the Sustainable Business Council today. And, you know, we could there were a, lot, a number of companies. Yes, there weren't many specialising in the PR side of things. So there were entrepreneurial companies doing the mahi, eco store, urgent couriers were carbon neutral, Toyota, you know, these these were companies that were all proactive and 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 doing things, um, but they didn't have a dedicated comms agency helping tell those sustainable stories. So we felt very supportive, and you know, those the likes of Toyota, they were our first major company, and they have been loyal to us ever since. And over the last seventeen years, you know, we've really challenged each other. Um, but Steve Benici, founder of Urgent Couriers. He was championing the living wage back then, so yeah, it's quite it's quite fascinating, right? Because you sort of yeah, like I mean, urgent is quite a, a, a classic example because you're that is it's a highly competitive industry. It's one where you'd think that absent regulation, you're essentially imposing costs on yourself, which your competitor can just ignore and and potentially gain a price advantage. How you know? How have they been able to sort of survive and thrive while kind of taking on that that journey? Do you think? I think as times, I think it, it is a challenging market, absolutely, uh, and not everyone's prepared to pay a price premium. However, there are companies who who do care and will pay extra to do the right thing, and we've seen that increasingly as companies start measuring scope three emissions. They are looking at their supply chain. They are looking to make choices where it may not be the best, you know, the cheapest, but it, you know, it enables them to reduce their carbon footprint. So the planet wins is, you know, it's important. Yeah, it, it is, it is. So, so David, uh, you, you founded Hardwired, which is a consultancy focused on, you know, behavioral psychology, which, you know, is quite, is obviously a very important and, and not necessarily emerging, but like, you know, in the context of New Zealand, it's a relatively specialised discipline. Tell me about where, where that came from and, and where, where you sort of, or how you interact with, with your clients. Yeah, um, I think uh, not a dissimilar story to Nikki, really. The, um, the what, what drove uh, me founding Hardwired was, um, was, seeing businesses and 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 their customers and customers and businesses you know this yawning um a chasm emerging where um you know neither uh, neither were connecting to one another and uh and i you know i think that there was basically a, a general lose lose you know the customers were not getting um, the relationship nor the value that they wanted from a business and 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 certainly businesses were not Connecting to customers, and you know that that if anything, it's just increased. Uh, and you know, as as the economic um, pressure has increased, that's you know that's you know, you're seeing a lot of businesses just really struggling. Uh, and so, um, what we were seeing was, um, or what I was certainly seeing was 
the the you know business being dehumanized and uh, and and what um, I was really fascinated with was I had been working with for some time was psychology of people whether that whether that's at a cultural level or at a customer level or inside a business level and the emotional hardwiring of those people and so we you know we as human beings we're hardwired to uh, to do what we do, um, whether we choose to do it or not, like fight or flight, you know. Um, and so uh, what what we were seeing was that um, uh, if we could humanise the relationship between customers and businesses, then some, some remarkable things could and would occur. Um, and that's that's really where we are. So we're quite, um, you know, we're quite, we're very new to applying it to business. There's not many people that are have got um, uh, using um, behavioural economics at a business level. Um uh, there's, there's quite a lot of research around, around that, but not at a business level. I mean, you, in terms of your, your case studies, there's there's a frequent reference to this idea of an emotional connection uh, that that a, a client or a customer might make to to a business, which people can be cynical about. But obviously, we're all probably familiar with examples where it it actually feels real and has has profound impacts on, on the business. Are there examples of, or is there an example of a client that you've worked with where the sort of insights that you've delivered or, or, or the research that you've uncovered has, has had that, that kind of an impact and sort of had a, an actual tangible impact on the sort of way they conduct themselves and how they articulate that? Yeah, uh, look, I think... Um that's our that's our world with all of our clients. So uh, if if we we're not achieving that, you know, I, I think we're not we're not really um, not getting where we need to get to. I, th- I think the thing we're talking about here is a paradigm shift. So so businesses are, um, and I think sustainability is very much in this space. You know, the paradigm shift for both parties, for both uh, customers, consumers, and also businesses, and and the skepticism that can that uh, customers quite rightly have with with uh, some businesses who who uh, who, are, who are trying very hard to use uh, value based and purpose based marketing without meaning it, and so I think that's where the, the skepticism comes from. However, when it's done authentically and done well, uh, we have a, we have a term we call it "we're together," where the, where a business and its customers uh, feel that they're in this together, uh, and and that and what that together means that they're both. Uh, the, the role as a customer is supporting a societal or community um, value as and, and the business benefits and the, and the customer's benefit. And so the types of businesses that uh, we, we've had really good success with is um, uh, uh, Mitre Q is a cellular science business and it's built a very, very powerful business, very successful business um, with its customers in the US. Um, uh, Convita, we've just um, done some work with them and, and um, taking nature and manuka honey uh, and a very sustainable approach and bringing bringing US customers into the fold and really generating a powerful um, business uh, and revenue and also um, uh, a really fantastic support of building more um, sustainable relationships. Um, done some great work with the Ministry of Social Development, humanising its process, working with beneficiaries. We're the collectibles. Um, they're building a really global fan base uh, with off the back of building a really strong relationship with global fans. So, so that that idea of um, of business and and customers working together is a is like the core component of our of our philosophy. One thing that's quite sort of interesting and, and I suppose challenging for for both of you is that. A lot of the, you know, that, that sustainability umbrella, there's a lot that nestles underneath it, but these are kind of big, chunky, complex challenges that also have the, happen to have arrived or our awareness of them has arrived at a time of a very sort of fragmented communications environment. And there's a couple of pieces to that, but let, let's start with how do you, you know, get, given that reality that that's the, the kind of old world that probably all of us um, grew up in of, a, of, of more of a monoculture where you know the the if you created a piece of work or, or, a, or a method of a, a business um, uh, meeting a, a customer that that it was relatively easy to 
kind of uh, put that in front of them and the feedback mechanisms that might sort of d- dispute it or uh, were, were relatively oh they're, they're much lower in the mix you know how, how do you navigate that environment given the you know just given just the huge complexity of it uh, now it is a challenge there is no doubt our advice to clients is to focus on their values uh, we have a very diverse society those you know the people that these companies are wanting to employ are going to be attracted to a company with really strong values that align with their own personal values. So if you see something happening uh, that doesn't align with those values, um, it makes sense for that company to call that out or to respond in a way that makes sense to that value system. So we really encourage clients to think about, we talk about a Southern Cross, the navigating stars, um, it's relevant to our country um, and and focus on that and not be swayed by some of the polarizing opinions that might be circulating um, to really stay true to those values. And we are very lucky because we are working with purpose-driven companies that are very genuine in their commitment to that purpose. So it makes it a little easier. Um, but there's a massive, massive job for comms to do to take people, you know, whether it's internal staff, employees, contractors, customers, investors, local communities, you know, mana whenua, there's there's a lot of relationships um, that need to be built um, based on that value system. So, you know, internal comms is often overlooked. In our industry, we call it the Cinderella, you know, um, it doesn't get a whole lot of love, but Actually, if you can create that bedrock of comms inside your organization and get alignment on, you know, why why you're doing what you're doing, what you stand for, then you'll find the confidence to take a stand as a brand. You know, you talk about brand standing. Companies can't do that unless they have that amazing foundation internally. So, David, I mean, you you know, the, getting back to that sort of emotional connection idea and, and sort of thinking about what, what Nikki was saying – the, the fact is that in this kind of environment that we're living in, the same object, the same message can be interpreted in quite wildly different ways by um, aspects of an audience. Do, do companies or, or organizations ultimately have to sort of basically pick a lane or, or is there a way of, of kind of using your insights to appeal to – Different different uh, audience segments in, in in different ways, and ultimately still progress the whole. Yeah, I, I think that's that's partially true. I, th- I think um, I think there's a step before that. Uh, the, the this idea that uh, um, uh, you know you you build a brand and you and you you know you communicate to people. Uh, I think that's fraught with challenge right and i think this is what you're talking about is is um you know if if you're a business your values and your purpose and your intent uh it's so 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 important uh and it has to be done with people you know you have to develop that purpose and those values and and that intent with the people that matter to you and uh you have to be very clear about who those people are uh and and then when you when you when you it's like it's like having a business and, and all your early intention, your only intention is to flog product, you're not going to get very far. Um, and so, so business uh, is entirely about working with people and not doing things to people, whether that be internally or externally or customers or partners or whatever the case is. If you, ta- if you take that paradigm forward and you build your business that way, then you've you've got a very good chance of being very successful because people will join you and help you become successful because it's a shared values, shared belief situation. And that's a that's a very that's a market change from for so many people. You know, many many people are are in business in senior roles that were very much in in the space of let's just sell things to people or flog it to people. And I think this is you know this is the where it gets very sticky and very problematic. Um, but you, you know, business take on a role. We're doing this together. It's a, it's, it's a, 
it's a very much a win-win. You, you can do great things when you take that approach. Um, it requires a very, very different approach, though. I mean, I mean that, that sort of connects up to one thing which I think is, is quite uh, or at, at the core of, of this. You know, I, I remember um, last year I went to a, a conference put on by IAG, and it was it was basically delivering just a, a big kind of state of the climate report. It's a huge piece of work for them, and the sort of subtext was it that we're in this adaptation era and huge chunks of New Zealand, their their houses are going to become uninsurable with the implication that they, they, they just can't really be where they are. Six months on, we have the floods, and and that is sort of made viscerally clear. Because some of these conversations, there's obviously this aspirational version, but there's also quite a confrontational thing that people won't want to hear. How do the, you know, and I think this is probably both of you would have some interesting insights in this. How do they? How do businesses that have to have an uncomfortable conversation with customers or potential customers do that in a way that doesn't sort of alienate them? But David, maybe you can sort of speak to that from a behavioural psychology perspective. Well, I, I'm you know I I live in the Hawke's Bay now, and uh, you know it's it's you know I, I didn't get dam- I didn't get um, impacted by flooding, but I have plenty of, plenty of friends um, who had who were. Um, so yeah, it is visceral for sure. Uh, look, I think, I think the thing, I think it's the same thing. You know, if you, if you, if a business like an insurance business would say, Hey, we're going to do this to you. It gets, it, 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 you know, human beings being what they are, uh, you know, we, we don't react at all well to fear or, or demands or, or being told what to do or, or anything like that. And so, and so, you know, we might, you might say, oh, well, we have to do it with empathy. It's like, well, not even that, actually. It, the question has to be done from a business. How do we do this together? How can we help you and you help us achieve a result that's going to be really, or achieve something that's going to be really beneficial for all of us? Uh, and I think that's, you know, that is the question and, and the conversation, which has to be an open conversation that needs to be had rather than, hey, we're going to do this to you. you this is what's going to happen. Um, you know, it's going to be bad, but hey, you know, suck it up. It's going to, you know, and that just never works. And so, and so, yet it's, it hasn't really been uh, the space that business is operated in, but, but now it has to be. Uh, if we want to achieve anything, uh, it has to be some, some, uh, something where we share the solution, the development of the solution. As soon as a government or any or any business goes down the path of we're going to do this to you, uh, guess what? It, you know it, it's going to blow up in everyone's face. Um, you need it needs to be done with people, um, and it might not be pleasant, sure enough. But guess what? You know you still have to you have to get to a point where there's a solution there. The Fold is brought to you by O-Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa, with over 4,000 out-of-home advertising sites nationwide across both street furniture and retail centres. I'm super grateful to O-Media for enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Ready to rediscover the joys of cycling? With over 300 kilometres of cycle paths across Tamaki Makoto, Jumping on your bike and going for a ride is such a fun way to discover the city from a different perspective. Cycling is getting more and more popular across Auckland, so now's a great time to join the hype and give cycling a go. Head to at.govt forward slash cycling to find your nearest cycleway today. Nikki, are there you know, examples with clients that you've worked with where whether it's internal to, to the company or, or sort of external to society they've chosen to or had no option but to have a conversation of that nature with um yeah with with their clients or customers nothing in that um sort of managed retreat adaptation space however um you know major service change or or if there's a particular issue that's impacting a customer negatively the insight would be communication is at the heart of the response. And to David's point, you know, this has to be co-created. So uh, you do have to, someone has to make a decision as well. I think part of the challenge is if there's no decision happening, 
um, people are left in that flight or fight response stage and that's challenging. So really communication, even if there is no decision that can be drawn just yet, communicating where you're at in the process, what that process looks like and being very clear at each point when you're reaching these milestones and what's coming next so people can plan. You know, it takes time to absorb sort of the process here. Um, I mean, I think this is going to be one of one of the big conversations next year and it's going to be from communities in the Hawke's Bay. It's going to be communities possibly in quite affluent suburbs in Auckland as well. So, and there's going to be um, a need for a lot of communication to affected individuals, affected communities, mana whenua. Everyone is going to have to be at that table and feel like they are part of a solution. Yeah, which, you know, often I think historically you it was a very top-down sort of here, here is the, the sort of menu type situation, which and that's probably the big profound change. And if you've got people in leadership positions who came up in a different era, you can see how that's something that would take a while to get to potentially. Nikki, I wonder if you could talk about a specific client that, you know, you mentioned them before, a foundational client of yours, um, Toyota, which on some level don't look like a classic sustainability story, one of the world's largest car manufacturers, but have actually been, uh, you know, I actually, I often think that, that if you want to look at for where real progress will happen, it's in the biggest organisations in the world because they've got the most um, room to, to affect kind of mass change, even though there's a lot of people who are deeply cynical about it. Uh, you know, t- tell me how you have worked with them and, and what, what you've seen from that organisation that makes you sort of believe and then how you tell that story or get, get that story out into to the, to the public. So for me, I mean, Toyota, had, like at every level, globally, locally, um, they it's, the sustainability ethos runs through that business. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's the hearts and minds, right? So on the one hand, it's, it's the, the minds pieces that the science-based targets that they've set. And so putting themselves into that space where they have a target that they have to reach forces them to make hard decisions as a business. Um, that is one thing that a lot of companies still need to do is really assess what is the end game, how are we going to get there, and then actually make a plan and execute against it because what we see a lot of is targets but no action plan. Mm. Okay, so Toyota have done an incredible job, I think, as have, I'll call out Air New Zealand as well, for creating, setting the targets and having an actionable plan. Um, in fact, the concrete industry would be another. They've just launched a roadmap, same thing. They've done the science. They've worked out the targets that they need to hit to become carbon neutral um, by 2050. And then they work back from that to how they're going to get there. So it has to be realistic. And these things have financial implications. So they are not taken lightly. It is lightly. It's the entire business that's across it as well. It's not siphoned off to sustainability. It's very much... Um, a company-wide um, process. The other thing I would say is on the mind side, so how you move customers towards adopting new technology that's more sustainable. Challenging, right, because often there's a price premium. So, I mean, we've experienced just recently we've in this country, we've had the rebate for electric vehicles, so it's enabled people certain people to get into yeah. electric vehicles. That's a challenge, right? So what admi- what I guess I admire about Toyota is that they recognise that that's not a solution for every New Zealander and they have partnered, you know, they're trying to create mobility. They're transitioning from a traditional automotive business into a mobility company and they want to take people with them. So they want to make mobility affordable. They want to make it accessible and they want that technology to be low emissions. So that's the basis for decision making and one thing they did recently was partner with the Tyndall Foundation and Arkina and MSD. And they created this program called Waka Aranui, which is based in South Auckland. Toyota provides a hybrid 
low emissions vehicle to families and who are participating in this program. And then Akina is measuring the impact that that mobility solution has given to that family. Uh, the impact report has just come out and we have seen that these families are now they're telling us that they can now get to doctor's appointments that in the past they wouldn't have been able to get to. They can engage in education and employment. So there is quite profound influence that mobility can have on, on a well society um, and being a full full participant in society. So to me, that I get fired up by that. I think that's that's really you know exciting, and we can scale it now. We've done the work; it's been measured. You know how can we how can we go further, go faster? Um, and of course, there's emissions savings as well. So that's the bonus, right? Um, and I think the other key point I would make is around collaboration, because whilst one company can do a lot, and especially the bigger the company, the more impact they can have. Um, however, the we, the challenge is so vast that we won't be able to do it. You know, company by company, we do have to actually collaborate and not just industry competitors at an industry level, but also partnering with NGOs, partnering with charities, partnering with government. And, and that's, I think, the real focus now is how can we join up our, you know, our strengths, and and really tackle tackle these issues. Do do you feel like yeah? You know, because on the one hand, there's never been more sort of urgency or or energy around it, but there's also you know you get critiques from the left that it's not far enough, or a cynicism about um, a large scale corporate that inevitably still sells trucks, uh, its involvement, and in, from certain aspects of the the right that. Uh, this thing's not real, or, or at the very least, like we should be, you know, much later in the piece on, on on motion that we are. Does the core of the business stay strong through at that? And you know, you obviously have, have election campaigns which can make these issues quite live. Like, do you find that, especially throughout the the span that you've been working, that that you can sort of tell something about the, the fundamental character of, of a business by how they respond to those external factors? Mm, there's no doubt we are getting caught up. There are culture wars. You know, we, we're not immune yeah. to that here in, New, here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. There's The key, I think, is to stay your course, you know, to, to focus on that Southern Cross <laughs> or the North Star, depending on, you know, what you're, what, what you're aligning to. But that, that is the key. Um, and you know, to constantly engage with people to find out what they're thinking and feeling. You know, we do a lot of work with companies in that regard where they, you know, they know what, they have their finger on the pulse, not just from traditional market research, but also from, you know, understanding what, what are the material topics that are impacting people right now. So that's a key. You've got to get these insights, the work that David's doing. You know, these are the kinds of things that will enable companies to really stay the course and, and move at speed. So David, I, I, there's a client of yours, uh, Stormy Fruit, which, you know, seemed to be quite an interesting example. You know, like food waste is this perennial thing that it just sort of sits there in front of us as a society and doesn't seem to to improve. And so, so many aspects of it are just kind of almost indefensibly stupid and yet – we don't change, whereas Stormy Fruit seems to be like a classic example of taking insights like yours to try and step change how we relate to to that product. Can you sort of drill into you know the the sort of insight and how it was actioned with with, with that business? Yes. Yeah, so, well, uh, the company we were working with was uh, a company called Golden Bay Fruit. They are uh, they grow premium apples, like the you know the, the world's best apples. Uh, and they ship them to Chinese markets. We were also, we saw we're working with them, but we were also um, deeply interested in Chinese consumers. So we'd done a lot of work with Chinese consumers. And so we joined up those two, we, you know, joined those two dots really. Uh, at that time, uh, Golden Bay Fruit had, we were affected with a 100, one in 100 year hailstone. So we're talking hailstones that were, the size of um, golf balls, 
which wrecked their crop just before it was due to be picked, um, they basically said to us, oh, well, we're done. I think we're out of business. And what we knew about uh, Chinese consumers that they were in the very, very concerned about the, the um, safety of food. So unlike ourselves, uh, we're, we're not concerned at all about safety. Our, our assumption is food will always be safe. Chinese consumers were far from it. Their concern was that um, you know food could be poisonous, had been so in, the, in many cases. And so, uh, and, and so we had these two, two, two equal and opposite interactions going on. Consumers who are worried about safety of food and Golden Bay Fruit selling premium apples that was basically uh, not premium anymore because uh, it had been affected by hailstones. So, and really the apples had, just, had been dented. And uh, one of one of my team said, "Well, why don't we create a brand called Stormy Fruit?" And Stormy Fruit is kissed by nature. And so what you had is a is a very authentic uh, uh, apple that had been, you know, it, uh, impacted by nature. And it took us a lot of um, effort to convince Golden Bay Fruit that maybe there was an opportunity where we could create this brand called Stormy Fruit. We could package the apples, send it to China, to, to supermarkets, and perhaps it would be successful. And emotionally, uh, this new brand, these apples, would really connect to people at a, at a very you know, powerful emotional level of safety, uh, safety and security. And as they said, okay, well, why don't we give it a try? And so we packaged up you know, several containers, uh, sent it to... Um, some supermarkets in Shanghai, uh, and I got a, a you know text with uh, from the owner of Golden Bay Fruit, and it showed um, had some people on the ground that showed people queuing up around the block uh, for this um, Stormy Fruit brand. And what it did is it emotionally connected to consumers who were who were needing safety uh, from their from their food, and I think that was such a profound. Um, uh, example of how an emotional need, if it's met, can can be you know huge, uh, hugely connected behavioural economic um, play for New, New Zealand businesses in this case. So stormy fruit, you know, um, uh, fruit that was kissed by nature, bang on, it really resonated. Now, you you can't short of um, you can't generate that, you can't create it. It just happened to be made that way. And so, yet, yeah, it was such a powerful uh, example of um, an emotional um, need um, being met. Well, it's, a, it's an amazing story and I guess shows that there is, e even in circumstances which, which sort of feel catastrophic, that there, there's opportunity too. Finally, I just wanted to get your, both your perspectives on this because – there's this these sort of dueling narratives at the moment that can feel like they're in conflict that you know in some ways the the hailstorm of of high inflation and the sort of cost of living crisis running into all of these big longitudinal problems that nestle under that sustainability umbrella you know do, do you have do you sense that that sort of political economic focus on uh cost of living which has implicitly or actually sometimes explicitly said we're just going to have to take a break from progress on those other goals. Has it sort of dented an overall interest in that? And, and you know, or, and if so, how, how would you sort of go about countering that from, from a kind of a broad emotional behavioral science or communication perspective? Uh, look, I think it's a great question. I, I think, um, if you take the if you take the approach that uh, sustainability uh, initiatives are done to people or are done separately, like they're a little sidebar or, or a separate um, initiative, uh, and and therefore they can be turned off or on, um, then inevitably um, they will be turned off or on, um, depending upon the the economic climate. Now, I think that's indicative of, of really the, the, the issue uh, that we have with, with anything cause-related. It becomes voluntary or 
uh, perhaps only necessary when there's money. And uh, I, th- I think that's, that's an, the, the singular problem with thinking about sustainability or any cause-related um, issue this way. If, it's, if sustainability or any initiative is done with people, then, then it doesn't get turned off. It's an, it's an intent that, that has to be taken no matter what the economic climate. So, so people are involved and, 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 and are engaged no matter what. And I think this is the, the point, you know, if, if it's done with people and people are doing sustainability, we're doing this together, then, then I think no matter what happens, no matter what the political or economic climate, it's done together. Uh, and I think that's, you know, communities and society say, no, this is so important. We can't turn this off. We have to do this together. And so I think that that's a paradigm shift, um, which we have to really engage. So sustainability is not done separately or, or, or communicated separately. It's done together with people. So I think that's that's such an important and it's a, a fundamental um, a component of how you think about um, cause-related sustainability. You have to do it with people, co-create it, do it together, get people to, 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 to make it thrive together. So I think that's, you know, sounds sounds so simple, um, but it's a, it's a design process that has to change right from the get-go. What about you, Nikki? Yeah, I think it's it's interesting, right? So if you uh, – say you're a person who's been impacted by the floods this year, you're probably still dealing with the aftermath of that. So you're not turning off your response. Um, so individually, I think – there's other people out there, a lot of most of New Zealand, who are really, really struggling with this cost of living, and and so you go into that scarcity mindset, right? Of like, how can I, how can I save? And sometimes you do drop the thing that that could have an environmental benefit because there was a price premium attached to that. So I think that is that is true. That is happening. However, at a corporate level, there is more momentum than ever. So we see this in the Climate Leaders Coalition. We see this with the compliance through, uh, you know, um, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures and the soon-to-be-released Nature-Related Disclosures. So there's there's a momentum building at that corporate level and the challenge is that intersection with cost of living. But there is a total interdependency between the E and the S and ESG and and it's really hard to... To yeah, to ignore one really. Um, we obviously find in that survey that Cantar put out earlier this year, the Better Future Study, that was quite shocking for a lot of us in the industry because cost of living was so dominant and climate change had dropped so far down in terms of people's priorities, which was totally understandable, but also. Oh, a little bit frustrating because you want to keep moving, right? Um, and you know the size of the challenge and the time frame associated with that challenge. So, but that's the reality. That is what we are dealing with. So, um, so that's the challenge. In fact, people in that survey, even if they had been directly impacted by the floods, so directly impacted, they were still putting climate change further down, which suggests that. Also, there perhaps is still, with climate change, there's still that thought around it being collective action, not necessarily individual responsibility. I think there's something in that. Um, And so um, what I love recently, a great example recently, Auckland Council um, initiative to recycle our food scraps. Low effort required because the bin turned up at our house and we just started composting food scraps and for people who are already composting food scraps um like we've got a we've got a compost bin at home so I was already doing it I was thinking what value is this going to add it's just going to duplicate my current effort um but actually I can compost a lot more than I could before so there was a benefit that I hadn't perceived there to be um, and I thought the communication of that service change was extraordinary because they made it very um, like attractive for us to start composting, and they gave us this future vision where, you know, this will help help us, you know, plant plant more, you know, grow more crops and and create more food. So um, I, I 
I thought that was quite a successful execution, which both ticks the box on saving money because you're, you know, wasting less food, but also has this environmental benefit. Yeah, it, it, uh, it's it's good to kind of end on a note where there is a a way of threading that needle because it, it, it can feel like on some level there has been a, a, a kind of vacation of the space. But, uh, yeah, great to hear that. And, and the fact that, you know, elections come and go, but the momentum at that corporate level is, uh, you know, is kind of it feels unstoppable, and that I guess that's where the the legislative piece comes in. Hey, uh, thank you both, uh, David and, and Nikki, for, for coming on the fold today. I really uh, appreciate it, and and just like a, a fascinating, knotty topic, and kind of the most important job in the world right now. That's a pleasure, and it's always great to to discuss these topics from different perspectives as well to build our understanding and um, collaboration. Yeah, thank you, thank 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 you. Uh, I think it's. It's such a, it's so, so good to have places where you can have conversations that I think are so so important like this. So no, thank you, thank, I really appreciate um, having us join. That's really really cool. And thank you for O Media for sponsoring cool stuff like this. Very much I endorse that. That was the fold brought to you by our partners at O Media, making brands unmissable and public spaces better across Aotearoa. Huge thanks to O Media for sponsoring this episode of The Fold and enabling us to make unmissable connections with Kiwis. Kia ora e te iwi, te Aihe Butler here, podcast manager at The Spin-Off. If you enjoy listening to our podcasts, consider supporting our mahi by signing up to become a Spin-Off member at thespinoff.co.nz slash donate. The Spin-Off Podcast Network.